Thank you all so much for joining us for Lessons from Trailblazing New England Women. Author Patricia Harris is with us tonight to give her popular presentation based on her new book, New England's Notable Women, Stories and Sights of Trailblazers and Achievers uh, in the Zoom webinar. Uh, Patricia and her, and her husband, David, have written more than 30 books on travel, food, and art, including their most recent title, Boston's Historic Hub, a tour of the metro region's top national landmarks. Uh, Patricia has a personal interest in exploring and celebrating women making their mark on the world. Uh, she lives in Cambridge and can be found online at www.hungrytravelers.com. And just a little bit about the book. Um, so the, the book's name uh, is uh, New England Notable Women, Stories and Sights of Trailblazers and Achievers. New England has nurtured countless women who shook off traditional gender roles to forge their own identities. Their achievements are legion. Um, let's see, Princess Red Wing served as a delegate to the UN and co-founded Rhode Island's Tomaquac uh, Museum. Boston, um, uh, let's see, Boston's Isabel Stewart Gardner had the acute uh, artistic vision to establish the museum that bears her name. Harriet Beecher Stowe ignited public opinion against slavery, uh, ar arguing uh, against the Civil War, and uh, has displays uh, in her Hartford uh, home uh, made clear. Uh, pioneering naturalist Rachel Carson jumpstarted the modern environmental movement with her writings about the rocky beaches and quivering tide pools, tide pools, tide pools of South Port Maine. <laughs> I've been at work for 10 hours, Patricia. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> uh, New England's uh, Notable Women shines the spotlight on 45 of these trailblazers and achievers and directs readers to the homes and sites throughout New England where their stories come to life. So all 100 of us or so, let's give a big oh virtual God. round of applause to Patricia for joining us here tonight. And Patricia, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. And wow, I'm really honored that so many of you have tuned in on this beautiful evening. Um, I've really been looking forward to it. And I really want to thank Robert for you know inviting me and, and for pulling this all together. Um, the last time um, I we met, my husband David Lyon and I um, did a Zoom presentation on one of our other books, um, Historic New England, which is you know a roundup of 100 national landmarks in our region. But tonight I'm here on on my own, and I'm talking about um, this book that you see on the screen. As Robert said, New England's notable women: the stories and sights of trailblazers and achievers. So I do want to tell you that I think that title is kind of a mouthful. I wanted to call it Yes, You Can, but you know, my publisher had, had the last word on that. But honestly, I think Yes, You Can is really appropriate because it's the message of the 45 women um, that I've written about. And they shook off the expectations of their gender and you know the limitations of their times to every one of them make their own mark in the world. And they span actually four centuries of New England history. And they're such a talented lot of artists, authors, designers, scientists, conservationists, collectors, and museum founders. A number of them are activists who you know, stood up for their principles, even in the face of really strong opposition. And I think their achievements are all the more extraordinary when um, you consider that a number of the women were denied more than the most rudimentary you know, education because of their gender. And as I was writing, I realized that access to education is a theme that really runs through the book and through um, women's lives. So as Robert said, each of the women that I wrote about is associated with a site that you can visit and where I do think her story kind of comes to life. And I was really pleased when a woman at a previous talk told me that um, setting each woman in a particular place made them seem more interesting and more human. So um, I hope you all agree. So tonight, I'm going to introduce you to eight women who span two centuries of New England um, history. And don't worry, I have lots of photos. And my husband, David, is here. He's my um, check person. He's handling the AV. So. I did, um, as the title suggests of my talk, I did learn a lot um, from these women, and I hope that you enjoy getting to know them as much as I did. 
they really are inspiring. Yes, you can. Um, and that is, as Robert said, we'll have some time for questions at the end. And I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, hearing your thoughts. So I'm going to start now with Prudence Crandall. And she founded, here she is, she founded the Canterbury Female Boarding School in Canterbury, Connecticut in 1831. Now, she was born in 1803, and in terms of education, frankly, she was one of the lucky ones. She was um, born into a Quaker family, and her parents believed in equal education for boys and girls, so she was able to attend a um, friends boarding school, you know, Society of Friends boarding school in Providence, Rhode Island, and she was already you know, an experienced teacher when the town fathers of Canterbury, Connecticut, asked her to open a school for young women. So she took over this really beautiful federal home right on the town green, you know, a really, really prominent location in the town. And daughters from the town's leading families um, began to attend her school. Now, all was going really well until Crandall admitted Sarah Harris as a day student in 1832. So that was only a year after the school had opened. Now, this is the only photo that I could find, and actually um, the site helped me find it, of Sarah Harris. As you can see, she was you know, a mature woman by the time this was taken. But she was you know, just a young woman at the time, and um, she was the daughter of an African-American farmer. She had been able to study some in the local schools, and she wanted a little more education so that she could, in turn, teach other young African-American children. So Prudence Crandall was glad to admit Sarah Harris to her school, but you know what? The rest of the town, not so much. Um, Crandall was already a supporter of the abolitionist movement. And when the local families started to withdraw their daughters, she decided that she would open her school to what she called young ladies and little misses of color. And you know, ultimately, she enrolled about 20 young girls from um, free Black families in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. And just by the way, she charged $25 per quarter for board, washing, and tuition. Now, it is, frankly, an understatement to say that the town was not happy. Um, the girls were threatened with violence. The school's well was polluted. A rock was thrown through the window and a corner of the building was actually set on fire. If you visit, actually be sure to ask the guides to show you the charred boards because they remain as a testament to intolerance. Um, then the town also went so far as to resort to legal maneuvers um, to ban the students from outside the state. Crandall was arrested twice and she spent a night in jail. But you know, she and the young women were just not deterred. They did not back down. But the final straw came in September of 1834. A threatening mob um, actually attacked the school and Crandall decided it was just too dangerous um, for the young women and she closed the school the next day. But I think this is her lesson. Some things are worth doing, even if they don't succeed at first. Um, her school only lasted three years, but I think it really made a difference. Crandall actually left New England, but she continued to teach and um, you know, to advocate for equal rights. And several, several of her young African-American students did go on to become teachers and reformers. And it was complicated, but her the legal case against Crandall did lay some of the groundwork for the um, 1954 um, decision of the U.S. Supreme Court that finally established equality in education. And Prudence Crandall herself also received her due in 1995 when the state of Connecticut made her the state heroine. And the state actually does own the house. And um, they open it for tours. It's, they operate it as a museum. And this spring, it reopened after very extensive renovation. You know, and I'll, I will warn you that if you decide to visit, staff are working on developing new exhibits. So you might find it a little empty. But as you can see from this picture, it's really a beautiful house. 
and the guides do a really good job of you know telling the story about the struggle for equal education that took place here. So I'm going to stay in Connecticut because I want to introduce you to Mabel Osgood Reich. Here she is. And her lesson boils down to three words, find another way. When she couldn't realize her dream of becoming a physician, she found another way to use her talents. She combined her aptitude for science with her love of nature and she became an early leader in the conservation movement at the turn of the 20th century. And she also founded Birdcraft Sanctuary, um, which is in Fairfield, Connecticut. It was the first private songbird refuge in the country. And actually she's sitting in the refuge here in the photo. Um, now, like Prudence Crandall, Mabel Osgood was fortunate. Um, she was born um, into a family that believed in equal education at least up to a point. Um, actually, she was born in 1859 and she grew up in New York City. Her father was a prominent Unitarian minister and he was happier for her to attend private schools. Um, but he put his foot down when Mabel wanted to attend medical school. As far as he was concerned, medicine was not a proper profession for women and he had the last word. But here is where Connecticut comes in. You were probably wondering. Mabel became fascinated with the natural world when she spent summers with her family at their country house in Fairfield. And in fact, she spent part of every year at the Fairfield home for the rest of her life. Um, and she began publishing nature essays in newspapers when she was still a teenager. And she became Mabel Osgood Wright when she married in her 20s, and about a decade later, she published her first book. I think it has a really charming title. It's called The Friendship of Nature, a New England Chronicle of Birds and Flowers. You know, and her timing was actually perfect. Bird watching was catching on as a sort of a, a popular leisure activity, but there were few guides for sort of the general public on, on the subject. And you know what? She was also lucky. Location, location. Her Fairfield neighbor was the Macmillan publisher, and he suggested that she write um, a guide to birds. So Mabel sort of tackled the project with what I imagine would have been the same rigor she would have put into studying the 206 bones of the human skeleton. Um, and she spent two winters co um, conducting research in the ornithology department of the um, American Museum of Natural History. And then Birdcraft, a field guide of 200 song games and song game and water birds was published in 1895. Um, here's the title page. And um, with its, the book had detailed descriptions of the birds and really um, lovely um, illustrations. And it kind of became the model of the modern bird field guide. And Mabel published other books for both adults and children but she did not stop there. In 1898, she founded the Connecticut Audubon Society, which was one of the earliest of the state organizations. And I should tell you that the um, first state Audubon Society was in Massachusetts, and it was also founded by two women. And those, those early women, like they dared to buck fashion. I mean, actually really their peers, um, by taking on the so-called plume trade. And thousands of birds were slaughtered every year just so women could have beautiful feathers for their hats. Kind of hard to imagine these days, but the, it was finally stopped when a law was passed in 1913. And it's that law is still considered a landmark in the um, early conservation movement. But you know what, it still didn't stop. In 1914, she opened Birdcraft Sanctuary on a plot of land um, near the Fairfield train station. And here is one of its um, trails in the spring. Um, and she chose the spot by the train station deliberately to make it easy for people to reach it by public transportation. But it's, you know, it's equally handy for birds as they, um, as they fly across Long Island Sound heading north from New Jersey. And Wright took an active hand in designing the sanctuary. 
She even specified a cat proof fence. Now, I honestly can't tell you how that um, worked out, but visitors can still enjoy the trails, the seats, and the observation shelters that she um, specified and walk around the spring fed pond, here it is, that she had dug. Now, Wright died in 1934, so she didn't see her sanctuary cut in half when Inter Interstate 95 was built in the 1950s. So the remaining sanctuary is only um, six acres and it's sandwiched between the busy highway and a railway line. But you know what? I think it just goes to show how important it is for us to preserve green space. And it remains, I think it's just a really sweet old fashioned place where more than 135 bird species have been spotted. Here's Mabel again in the sanctuary on one of her benches. And I think you can see she was more of a dog person than a cat person. Um, but if you visit in the spring, you might see as many as 20 species of warblers on any given day. Now, I think I hardly even have to mention my next subject. This is Anna Mary Robertson Moses, but you probably know her better as Grandma Moses. And I think you probably know what I'm going to say. It's never too late. Okay, so I have to admit that I took a few liberties here. Moses was born into a farm family in um, Greenwich, New York in 1860. And she and her husband, Thomas Moses, eventually settled on their, on their own farm in Eagle Bridge, New York. But, you know, I honestly, I just couldn't leave her out of my book. For one thing, she totally ignored the state lines between New York and Vermont as she you know, painted the rolling farmlands and, and country life with just joyful abandon. And she did actually live in Bennington, Vermont um, for part of her life. And the Bennington Museum has the largest public collection of her work. They also have this one room schoolhouse, David, <laughs> where she studied as a young girl. But she was only here, at, I think you can see it there on the left. Um, but she was only 12 years old when she had to leave school and go to work cooking and cleaning for a well-off family. And the truth is she really never sh shied away from the hard work of farm life, but as it became too demanding for her, she had to find other ways to keep herself busy. You know, first she took up needlework, but um, after a while arthritis made it too difficult for her to hold a needle. So she actually picked up a paintbrush and returned to her childhood love of painting. And here she is, I think she looks very comfortable and content. And she had such a rich store of memories that they seemed to just kind of flow off the paintbrush. And all she painted about 1500 paintings. You know, and at first Grandma Moses gave her paintings away, maybe sold them for a few dollars. She displayed them at country fairs along with her preserves, you know, and her baked goods. Um, things finally began to change for her in 1938. A New York art collector um, spotted a few paintings in the window of a local pharmacy. He bought them all and set about making her famous. Grandma Moses was in her late 70s and she began, became an art world star seemingly overnight. Like I said, it's never too late. Now the Bennington Museum has a separate Grandma Moses gallery and they do not allow you to take photos, but her images are so iconic that I think you can probably just picture them you know, in your mind, chasing the Thanksgiving turkey, hanging the wash, sledding down a snowy hill, cutting the Christmas tree. They all capture really idyllic sense of rural life. And here's the table where um, she worked and it's still covered with her paints and her brushes. The museum actually does a really good job of using you know, photos and media coverage to trace Moses' life and her celebrity status. She published her autobiography in 1952 and she appeared on the cover of Time Magazine the next year. Um, if you visit the museum, don't miss the recording of her 1955 interview with Edward R. Murrow on his TV show, um, See It Now. 
I always just get a kick out of it, you know, watching Grandma Moses. Uh, she chats about making soap and visiting the White House. And honestly, I think they seem of equal interest to her. So Life Magazine ran a cover story about Grandma Moses when she turned 100, and she died a little over a year later in December 1961. But if you visit the Bennington Museum, it's worth driving through the surrounding farm country. Honestly, it's so little changed, I think Grandma Moses might still recognize it. And her house in Eagle Bridge, New York is only about 15 miles from the museum. And you can't miss it because there's this big historic marker right out front. So now, at the opposite end of the age spectrum, here is Maya Lin. Education, really. As a modern woman, she benefited from the earlier struggles for equal education. She became an undergraduate school at Yale University less than a decade after the school became co-ed in 1969. And I have to tell you, Yale was founded in 1701, so they didn't exactly rush into it. But Lynn was a 21-year-old senior when she submitted a design for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial to be um, you know, dedicated on the National Mall in Washington, DC. Her professor, who by the way, also entered the competition, gave her a grade of B for the class project. But the jury of architects and sculptors was far more enthusiastic. Every one of them selected Lynn's design for more than 1,400 anonymous entries. They had no idea that was the work of a college student. So I think it just goes to show that you are never too young to dream big. And Lynn received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Yale in 1981, and then went back to earn a Master of Architecture degree that she received in 1986. So I do have to point out that she was born in Ohio and her studio is now in New York. But I really do think it's fair to say that Yale was the launching pad for her career. And again, that's the power of education. And she was on the path to becoming, I think one of the country's most sort of thoughtful and original public artists. Now, I'm sure many of you have visited Washington and walked along the two walls of black granite that record the names of more than 58,000 dead and missing. It's a really powerful statement and such a total departure from a traditional figurative memorial. Discussing her design later, um, Lynn recalled watching stonecutters um, etch the name of Yale's casualties from the Vietnam War in the university's memorial rotunda. And that, as she put it, the sense of the power of a name was just so powerful and it you know, made a lasting impression on her. But you don't have to travel to Washington DC to see Lynn's work. Honestly, she was the only logical choice when Yale decided to commission a sculpture to mark the 20th anniversary of admitting um, women to the undergraduate school. So here it is, it was completed in 1993. It's called the Women's, Ta Women's Table and it sits in front of Sterling Memorial Library in the heart of the campus. It, you know, it features an ellipse of blue stone with water bubbling from the center and the water washes over a spiral um, inscribed in the stone that traces the presence of women at the once all male university. And I'm sorry, it really is hard to see in this photo, but I'll tell you, it begins very tightly with a march of zeros. And then it begins to open up in 1873 when 13 women were enrolled in the School of Fine Arts. By the time Lynn graduated in 1981, the number had grown to a little over 1700. And when um, the women's table was dedicated in 1993, the number had climbed to um, about 5,200. And Lynn said that she chose the spiral shape because it, it suggests the beginning, but leaves the future open. If you're traveling around New England, there are other examples of Lynn's work. One of my favorite is the meeting room 
here it is on Queen Anne Square in Newport, Rhode Island. And what Lynn did was create a series of stone foundations that um, recall three centuries of buildings that once stood on the square. And they're not off limits at all. There are no barriers around them. In this photo, people are sitting down, getting ready to have lunch. And to me, that's a really successful piece of public art. And, you know, by the way, this project was supported by the Newport Restoration Foundation, which was founded by the heiress Doris Duke. And in fact, um, she owned one of the city's grand uh, mansions and the Restoration Foundation has really done a lot and continues to do a lot for the city. And Doris Duke is in the book too. And I am going to bring you now to Newport, Rhode Island, but I'm going to point you instead to this woman, Alva Smith Vanderbilt Belmont, quite a name. And she actually presided over not one, but two of Newport's over the top Gilded Age mansions. You know, by all accounts, Alva was actually quite a character. She was born into a distinguished Alabama family in 1853, and she moved with them to New York City shortly after the Civil War. The family eventually fell on hard times, but Alva secured her financial future by marrying William K. Vanderbilt in 1875. He was the grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt, one of the richest men in the country. Much to Alva's distress, all, the, all that money did not automatically open the doors to the upper echelons of Manhattan society. But Alva found a way. Legend has it that she and William threw a $3 million housewarming party for their new mansion on Fifth Avenue. And when Caroline Astor, who was kind of the gatekeeper to the elite, attended, she just couldn't stand to miss it. The Vanderbilt's social standing was secured. Now the Fifth Avenue mansion was later torn down, but by all counts, it was basically like an enormous castle. And you would think that would be enough house for anyone. But you know, in the late 19th century, wealthy families liked to spend the summer in Newport where the breezes made it much more cool and comfortable. So they needed another home for that. As a gift for Alva's 39th birthday, she and um, William began construction of this 52 room mansion. It's modeled on the Petit Trianon. And as you probably know, that's the mini palace at Versailles that was favored by Marie Antoinette. So I think that will give you an idea of Alva's self-image. So it's called Marble House for obvious reasons. There's as much inside, you know, as out. And it's now owned by the Preservation Society of Newport County. They do open it for tours. So you can be wowed by the Versailles-inspired dining room or by the Gothic room with William's collection of medieval armor. I don't have a photo of it, sorry. Or here by Alva's luxurious bedroom, <laughs> David. Whoops, <laughs> oh, just a second, technical difficulty. Second. Here it is, here is Alva's luxurious bedroom. William had his own. So I thought that building the house seemed like such a really wonderful romantic gesture. But I guess William's devotion to his wife only went so far. Three years after she moved into Marble House in 1892, Alva sort of bucked social convention by refusing to turn a blind eye to William's philandering. Instead, she sued for divorce and Marble House was part of her handsome financial settlement. Four years later, she married family friend, another long name, Oliver Hazard Perry Belmont. And she only had to move a block down Bellevue Avenue to um, Belmont's 50 room mansion. You know, here it is, it's called Bellcourt. You know, it looks pretty nice, but Alva had her work cut out for her. Belmont was a real sportsman and the ground floor featured a carriage room, stables and a marble trough 
for his horses. So as you might guess, Alva quickly um, evicted the horses and remodeled the mansion. Now, Rhode Island jewelry, jewelry designer, Carolyn Raphaelian of Alex and Annie fame, bought Belcourt in 2012. And she's financed a massive renovation and she does open it now for tours. Um, some of the furnishings, as you can see, are from her own collection of Art Deco furniture. But you know what? Back to Alva. After Belmont's death in 1908, she reopened Marble House and began her second act. Um, she was you know, in middle age and she was inspired by lectures by early suffragists and absolutely threw herself into the movement to secure voting rights for women. And she put Marble House to good use. She sponsored suffrage lectures. She hosted fundraisers to build support and raise money for the cause. And she often courted wealthy donors in a Chinese tea house that she had built on the back lawn. How could you say no? Um, anyway, it all goes to show that it's never too late to reinvent yourself. So for a break from all that glitz, I want you to meet Nina Fletcher Little. And she was one of the pioneers in collecting American folk arts. And she didn't just decorate her houses with hooked rugs in redware pottery. Through her rigorous research into past makers and owners, she helped to bring legitimacy to the whole field of folk arts. Now, by all accounts, Nina had a lot of confidence in her own taste. Just consider the exterior here of the 1728 farmhouse in Essex, Massachusetts, that she and her husband, Bertram Little, um, purchased in 1937 as a summer home. They called it Cogswell's Grant after the original land grant for the property. Now, colonial era homes like this were usually painted white or had those, I'm sure you've seen them, those silvery weathered um, shingles, but not Nina's house. She chose this really sunny yellow orange that she called persimmon. And her message, trust your own taste and don't be swayed by fashion. That's certainly what she did. The Little started collecting antiques shortly after they were married in 1925. But when it came time to furnish Cogswell's grant, they decided to fill it with furniture and decorative objects from the same era as the house and preferably from the same region. And they had lots to choose from. American folk arts were out of fashion with most homeowners and barely acknowledged by the fine arts establishment. When word spread that the Littles were looking for old stuff, you know, their name was just rushed to open their, their barns and their attics. So the Littles were able to fill Cogswell's grant with objects that delighted them, hooked rugs and red rare pottery, absolutely but also painted furniture, unusual rocking chairs, landscapes and seascapes, early painted portraits, decoys and boxes, lots of boxes. That's something that Nina particularly um, favored. The Littles collected as a team, but I do think it's fair to say that Nina was the captain. She'd received a high school education at the private Brimmer and May School in Chestnut Hill, and went on to become a self-taught expert in American folk arts. Um, Bert pursued a career um, working in publishing and for what is now historic New England, while um, Nina brought kind of a similar, I think, professional dedication and organization to collecting and documenting their objects. She was um, famous for placing little labels with tiny writing on the bottom of everything. Um, and the home is now actually owned by Historic New England and it's open for tours. Now, here is Nina's small office, which is itself, I think, you know, a real time capsule. You can see she had a manual typewriter, a rotary phone, and lots of ring binders. Um, and she wrote more than 150 books, articles, and exhibition catalogs that helped to legitimize and advance the study of American folk arts. And here's just a small sample of some of her writings. You know, and her in-depth knowledge, and I think even more than that, her genuine appreciate, a real appreciation um, for humble folk objects made her a much sought after expert in developing museum exhibitions, 
among her other projects, she um, studied probate documents and other records to develop the um, furnishing plan for the 1796 Salem townhouse at Old Sturbridge Village. But Cogswell's grant is her true masterpiece. And I think it's so unusual and fascinating to see this world-class folk art collection, really nothing like it, left just as its owners arranged it, lived in it, and um, truly enjoyed it. Drink. So the women I've uh, been speaking about so far face challenges on their own, but sometimes, however, there's strength in numbers. And the Mill Girls of Lowell, Mass, um, are a great example. They were actually the first class of working women in America, and they also sparked my country's first organized labor mo movements. And this is a contemporary sculpture that honors them in downtown Lowell. So the first large scale factory city in the country began in Lowell in the 1820s. And those textile mills could not have operated without young women who left their family farms and their small villages um, to work in the mills and to really try to expand their horizons. And they, these young women helped to make Lowell one of the country's largest manufacturing centers. By the mid 19th century, more than 40 mill buildings stretched for a mile along the Merrimack River. You know, by a century later, I think you all know the story, um, the mills were all closed, but the Lowell National Historic, Historical Park um, does a great job of preserving some of the buildings, the canals and the walkways that made Lowell, um, you know, a powerhouse of manufacturing. Now the Mogan Cultural Center, for example, occupies one of the former boarding houses um, where the young women lived. And the kitchen, the keeper's room, and this fairly large dining room were all on the first floor. The women slept upstairs three to four to a room and the boarding housekeeper fed them three meals a day and maintained a strict 10 p.m. curfew. The young women actually worked 12 to 14 hours a day and they had a half day off on Saturday and a full day of rest on Sunday after church services. Now, if you visit, don't miss the Boot Cotton Mills Museum. It actually occupies a later weave room from the 1920s, but it'll still give you, I think, a good idea of the kind of conditions that these young women had to endure. When you enter, the park rangers will give you earplugs, and trust me, you will need them. Even with only about a dozen of the 80 or so um, looms operating, the noise is so intense, the air seems to just absolutely vibrate. I don't know about you, but after a day like that, I would go back to the boarding house and just collapse. You know, but the young women, they were really seeking better lives. You know, they opened bank accounts, they shopped for stylish clothes, they attended cultural programs and lectures by, you know, noted figures like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Edgar Allan Poe and Frederick Douglass. And they even published their own literary magazine. You would think, that the mill owners would um, show their appreciation for the young women who helped make their forged fortunes. This, by the way, is an, an engraving by Winslow Homer. Um, but, you know, in terms of the mill owners, you know what, you would be wrong. You know, instead they cut wages in 1834. And instead of just taking it, some of the women organized as the Factory Girls Association and they staged a strike. Honestly, it was practically unheard of at the time. And one of the mill owners actually declared that a spirit of evil omen prevailed. But the truth is that management prevailed. They broke the strike and they crushed another one two years later. The women were much more savvy when they organized again about a decade later. Their goal was to reduce the workday to a mere 10 hours. So strength in numbers, they sometimes joined uh, forces with a working men's association. They founded chapters in other um, mill cities. They um, published pamphlets exposed, exposing the poor working conditions in the mills. 
Um, they presented a petition to the Massachusetts legislature and they testified before a legislative committee. And I don't even need to remind you, they didn't even have the right to vote. So in 1847, the New Hampshire legislature actually became the first in the country to limit workdays to 10 hours, but the law was never enforced. And the Massachusetts legislature was not moved to action. But the pressure did force the mill owners to shorten the workday to 11 hours. You know, and not long after that, the workforce of the mills, you know, changed as immigrants who were so desperate for work under any conditions started to take over the jobs. And the women organizers may not have achieved all their goals, but as I said earlier, some things are worth doing, even if you don't fully succeed. And the Lowell Mill Girls did earn a place in labor history. According to the AFL-CIO, the Lowell Mill Girls started something that transformed the country. No one told them how to do it, but they showed that working women didn't have to put up with injustice in the workplace. They got fed up, joined together, supported each other, and fought for what they knew was right. Okay, everybody, hold on. We're almost done. It seems a little odd that Mariah Mitchell, here she is, comes last because she was truly a woman of firsts. Her story begins on October 1st, 1847. She was sweeping the night sky with a modest telescope when she spotted the blurry object that would change her life. She was the first American, not the first woman, the first American to discover a comet. It became known around the world as Miss Mitchell's Comet. You know, and her discovery wasn't simply a matter of chance. She was born on the island of Nantucket in 1818. And again, she was in, born to a Quaker family and they sent her to local schools, but you know, she craved more education and she studied mathematics, surveying, engineering, navigation, and astronomy with her father who was an amateur astronomer. She published her comet discovery in the Journal of Britain's Royal Astronomical Society, and she received a medal from the King of Denmark for identifying a new comet not visible to the naked eye. As her reputation grew, she traveled around the United States and Europe, visiting other observatories and meeting with other astronomers. She was the first woman allowed in the Vatican Observatory that um, was located in a monastery and, and traditionally off limits to women. Okay, this is going to sound like a broken record, but here we go. In 1848, Mitchell was the first woman elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And just so you know, they didn't admit another one until 1943. And she was also the first female member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. We're not done. In 1865, she became the first female astronomy professor in the United States. And she was one of the original faculty members hired um, at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. And it was founded as a women's college and Mitchell probably made her greatest impact as a pioneer in opening professor, you know, profess, professions in the sciences for women. So her observatory with teaching space and her living quarters was the first building completed on the campus. And it boasted a 12 inch telescope, which was one of the largest um, at the time. And I just love this photo of her outside um, with some of her students. And you know, she was a role model and a mentor to countless young women who joined her in studying comets, double stars, the surfaces of Jupiter and Saturn, and you know, all other kinds of celestial phenomena. She retired from Vassar in 1888 and she died in Lynn, Massachusetts the next year. She didn't return to Nantucket, but the island still celebrates her as one of their own. You know, in 1902, the Mariah Mitchell Association was founded to carry on her commitment to the sciences. In the summer, they opened the 1790 house um, where Mitchell was born to the public. And they 
also operate two observatories where astronomers and students conduct research. You know, and here's an old postcard of the uh, Vestal Street Observatory that was the oldest of the two. It was built in 1908. And the observatories also host, observ they host observatory nights so that others can glimpse the night sky that Mitchell so loved. So by now you may have guessed Mitchell's most important lesson. Once you've broken one glass ceiling, go ahead and break another and another and another. But you know, I think she would have said, do it with joy. As Mitchell once declared, when we are chafed and threaded by, when we are chafed and fretted by small cares, a look at the stars will show us the littleness of our own interest. Well, and I think that's a lovely note to end. So um, thank you all again for um, joining me. I wish I could have told you about all the other extraordinary women in the book, but I do wanna tell you, if you decide you'd like to visit any of these sites, please be sure to check their websites um, for their opening times. Some of them are seasonal and some of them are still keeping fairly limited hours, starting to open up a little more over time. Um, so, I would be happy to hear your questions and your comments. And um, please go to your local bookstore or to amazon.com if you're interested in purchasing the book. Um, honestly, I hope they find their way into many young women's hands, this uh, many women's hands this holiday season. And as I say it, hey, why not men too? <laughs> but thank you again. And thank you, Robert. <laughs> Yeah, Pat, a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Yeah. My so pleasure. Folks, yeah, folks, we have uh, about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, feel free to type some comments into the chat, some questions into the Q&A. Uh, and Pat, I'll start. Um, okay. So how did you um, how did you go about um, whittling your, your, your list down to, to 45 uh, women and uh, locations? Uh, that must have been very difficult. Well, you know... I, you know, I could have written an encyclopedia, Robert, if I just wanted to talk about all the amazing women in New England, but um, it became quite frankly a limiting factor to tie each one to a site, right. um, you know, limited it quite a bit because I wanted it to be a site that people could visit and really have a very rewarding and satisfactory kind of experience. And so I actually built off the book that you know, I've spoken to for your library before, you know, our National Historic Landmarks, that that um, some of the women that are in the book were also, their sites are also in that book and visiting those sites, um, some of the guides would put me on to other places and it just all kind of, um, built, kind of built, but again, um, I had more disappointment having to leave women out because there wasn't um, a good site than I did having to winnow it down. Sure, sure. Uh, so let's see. Kristen says, "Thank you. I will make uh, I will make visits to these places." I'm glad. Patricia, yeah. Patricia says, "Very inspiring." Uh, Mary says, "Thank you. This was amazing. So many women I had never heard of." Uh, Patricia says, "Wonderful. Thank you." Uh, Rika says, uh, thank you so much for such knowledge on trailblazing women in history. Have a good evening. Uh, Mary you. wants to know, of all the women you mentioned tonight, uh, did any of them have children? Oh, wow, that's a good question. Um, well, the ones I mentioned tonight, I Oh, Grandma Moses had quite a few children. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Maya Lynn has at least one, Maya Lynn, who is still alive, has at least one daughter. Mm -hmm. Lowell Mill Girls, I'm sure a lot of them did. Prudence, Prudence Crandall had, um, a, no, I take that back. No, she didn't have it. She had stepchildren, but I don't believe she had any um children of her natural birth sure, that's a sure. good question yeah yeah we you never know what you're going to get with these q and a's yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh kathy says i can't wait to read your book i really thank enjoyed your wonderful presentation great idea to have the site connection thank you so much for tonight's talk 
Uh, Deb found it fascinating. Joanne says, I will have to read your book. Joyce says, this was a fantastic presentation. Elaine says, very interesting. Jody says, she can't wait to read your book. Huck says, I wonder how much more these women would have found themselves if they lived today. So I wonder how much more these women would have found themselves if they lived today. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And again, so much of it, um, other women that I did talk about were so frustrated in their education and how much more a lot of them could have achieved if they had had, you know, greater education. And, and the other thing, though, that I think is instructive is um, women are still, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but having to, you know, advocate and fight for, for their rights. So some things have changed and some things haven't. Yes, uh, yes, unfortunately. Uh, Sally says, uh, so interesting, loved your commentary, you had wonderful photos, and I loved your enthusiasm, looking forward to reading your book. Uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions just due to time. Okay. Uh, Catherine says, are you planning uh, a follow-up for a second volume of Notable New Hampshire Women? Oh, well, I hadn't been, but... Um... It's definitely something to think about. There are two women from New Hampshire, um, you know, in the book, Krista McAuliffe, um, of course, the first educator astronaut, we all know about the challenger. And one of, I think the more um, surprising, but kind of fascinating, Grace Metallius, the author of, of Peyton Place, which um, Vanity Fair calls the, the first, um, blockbuster novel and but you know that was really important for exposing um subjects like incest rape and um you know abortion that people just didn't talk to when it talk about when it was published but i'm certainly open for suggestions of more new hampshire women and Teresa wants to know uh will there be a part two will there will there be a sequel to this book I would love there to be. I've actually um, gotten leads on a, a couple of other women that um, I discovered, you know, after I started doing um, this research. So I'd love to talk to my publisher, Globe Pequot. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's see, yeah. Julia, I have your book from the library and it's a great read. I'm Thank looking you. forward to visiting some of these sites. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Perhaps this is a question I should have led with. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll close with it. Uh, okay. Karen asks, uh, what drew you to this subject and moved you to write this book? Well, again, I, it kind of goes, it's true that I just have this interest in, you know, women and how women make their way in the world. And I have another book that I wrote about, it's called 100 Places in Spain Every Woman Should Go. And um, actually, I was thinking after that book, what can I do? And I thought, well, I really know New England. And because of the research my husband and I had done for the previous book, I already was aware of, of the number of sites. And the more I started looking, I saw that New England women had influenced the world in so many, you know, different ways that, you know, I didn't talk about, like, I was thrilled to discover, for example, that Rachel Carson, I mean, she launched the modern environmental movement, and she did a lot of her research and writing, you know, on, on the main coast. And so I just realized that there was a really inspiring women that I thought other people would be interested in learning about as well. But thank Quite. you for asking. So Patricia, we're coming up on eight o'clock. Uh, I'm gonna start to wind it down here. Uh, Barb says, enlightening and fascinating. I'm ordering a couple of copies from my local, local, best, uh, local bookseller. Many thanks to you, your husband and the Tewksbury Library. Uh, Mary notes that Elva Belmont uh, also had a daughter. Uh, Teresa says, oh, right. thank you. Yep, yep, yep. And, and two sons. sons. There you go. Yep. And then and Teresa, sons. Um, Teresa, Teresa, we'll, we'll wrap up with Teresa's comment. Uh, she simply says, thank you for writing this book. I really enjoyed this presentation. So Patricia, where can folks get um, their hands uh, on your book? I know it was released a few months ago. Uh, where, where do you suggest uh, folks can find it? 
Well, actually, some of the sites with gift shops are selling it. I'm hoping it's in a lot of local bookstores and, of course, Amazon.com. And I want to thank everyone for their attention and for these really lovely um you know, comments. It's very heartening. I kind of grew to love these women and I'm glad to hear that, you know, they're fascinating other people too. Great. Uh, so thank you again, Patricia. And thank thanks, Dave, for the, uh, thanks, Dave, to the, for the tech support. I <laughs> uh, want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring. want to thank the uh, 10 or so libraries who partnered with Tewksbury tonight. And uh, for anyone who logged on late, uh, just know that I'll send an email on Saturday uh, to all registrants with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, and information about some other upcoming uh, virtual uh, presentations that may be of interest. So thank you all so, so much, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. Thanks again, Patricia. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.